Well, welcome back everybody to Recorded Lectures. This is Chapter 10, Plate Tectonics. It's been a while since we met. And um, I hate that because plate tectonics is one of my favorite topics in geology. I get all excited about it. It's hard to show excitement when I'm doing these, um, these recordings. But here are the learning objectives. Um, you need to know what the contributions of Alfred Wegener were to the science of geology and explain how his evidence supporting, um, and explain what his evidence was supporting the continental drift hypothesis. Uh, outline the discoveries made on the seafloor by people like Marie Tharp and Harry Hess, seafloor spreading, and paleomagnetism that led to the unifying theory of plate tectonics. Distinguish the differences between continental and oceanic lithosphere and be able to state how those differences influence plate interaction. And then we'll look at the three types of plate boundaries. They're divergent, convergent, and transform plate boundaries. And we'll look at the type of geologic features that are associ uh, associ associated with each uh, type of plate boundary. Uh, so there are volcanic island arcs, there are continental arcs, there's spreading, there are ocean trenches and subduction zones, earthquakes, tsunamis, and uh, one of my favorites, ophiolite rock sequences. And then we'll look at the hazards as uh, associated with the Cascadia subduction zone, which is off of um, Northern California starting around Crescent City thereabouts, and then extends up past Oregon and Washington. And then we'll match geographic locations to the specific types of plate boundaries. So if you remember in uh, chapter one, uh, you studied the, differentiate, the differentiation of earth into layers. The crust and the upper part of the mantle are brittle, while the part of the mantle below called the asthenosphere is ductile. So the slow movements of the asthenosphere causes the brittle lithosphere to break into segments that we now call plates. And they come in two types, continental and oceanic. And that's a pretty good view of it. This goes hand in hand with uh, what Ben Franklin thought. He's, he compared the earth to an egg with the, the crust breaking into the shell, the, being the shell of the earth breaking into these different sections from molten movement underneath. He didn't quite have it right, but he was pretty close. And these are the major, earth's major lithospheric plates. Some are large, some are small. The large ones like the Eurasian plate and the Pacific plate. Um, small ones like the Juan de Fuca plate and the Cocos Plate. I'll grab the pen here and do a laser pointer. So there's the Juan de Fuca Plate right there. Here's the Cocos Plate, small. But they're all important because of the activity they generate, like earthquakes, like the formation of volcanoes. And notice that a plate can consist of both continental material and oceanic material. So for instance, here's the North America Plate. Well, Greenland, is on the North America plate. Part of the Atlantic Ocean Basin is on the North America plate. And if we go over here, here's Alaska, so we've flattened out the globe, so I have to jump over here. You see that there's a portion of Russia that's on uh, the North America plate, as well as a little snippet of Japan that's on the North America plate. So we can't get continents themselves and the plates confused because they're two different animals. Um, so what else should I show you here? Um, here's the Arabian plate. It's kind of squished in between the African plate and the Eurasian plate. And that's why we get some really cool mountains in this region. And then let's go to the next slide and look at earthquakes around the world. There are these major belts of earthquakes and they all correspond to plate boundaries. So if you knew nothing else about where the plates were, the location of the plates, if you just trace the, these areas of, of seismic activity, you would basically have the plate boundaries drawn.
So what we have to understand is that the positions, the shapes, the sizes of continents, oceans, and mountains have all changed throughout time. And in fact, even as I'm speaking to you, they are changing. So John McPhee is this, um, a fairly famous author. He's written uh, a bunch of books uh, related to geology, one of which um, is called Assembling California, which if you haven't read that, I uh, encourage you to do it. It's very easy to read. Um, but he is famous for this series of books that he wrote tracing the geology of the U.S. across Interstate 80 from the New Jersey shore to San Francisco. So one time he was being interviewed and he was asked if he could sum up in just one sentence the craziness, the weirdness, the awesomeness of how Earth works. And he thought about it for a bit and he said, marine limestone is at the top of Mount Everest. Now that's a very simple sentence, but it really goes quite deep because limestone forms in the lowest places on Earth, on the ocean floor. Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world, yet you have rocks that form in the lowest areas on Earth found at the highest places on Earth. So how does that happen? I hope after this chapter, you'll understand how it happens. Ocean floors are part of mountaintops now. Mountaintops have eroded and have washed in, into the oceans as sediments where those sediments become uh, rocks over time. So Earth is geologically active. There's no getting around that. It's dynamic. It's constantly reforming itself. Oceans form and they disappear. Mountains rise and are eroded away. This has been known for a long time, but not the why of how it all happens. So the world map, when we look at it, we think it's unchanging, but it's really just a blip in geologic time. It's changing even as we look at it. Things are moving, plates are on the move. So those aren't new ideas, but the evidence necessary to support those ideas is fairly recent and it's also ongoing. So what were the historical ideas of a changing Earth? Well, the first one, which everybody notices if they've ever looked at a globe, is this jigsaw puzzle fit of adjacent continents, um, specifically South America and Africa. This was first noted in the 1500s by cartographers. Cartographers are map makers. Um, but when they, you know, they didn't try to explain it. They just thought, well, okay, it's coastal erosion or something. It's just a coincidence. But then throughout the years, there were very influential thinkers that would bring up this apparent fit, but then the idea didn't go anywhere. Sir Francis Bacon, who was a famous English philosopher and thinker, pointed out the fit, but he didn't take it any further than that. Then our own Ben Franklin in 1782 proposed that the surface of the earth was like a shell that that slide that you saw uh, just a few seconds ago, uh, like a shell that was capable of being broken by movement of molten material underneath. Now, Ben was a brilliant guy, talented in many areas. He was an author, he was a meteorologist, he was an oceanographer, he was a newspaper man, a statesman, and apparently a uh, geologist because he was very close to explaining how it all happens without all the technological aid that we have today. But these ideas went nowhere until a guy by the name of Alfred Wegener came along. Wegener had this hypothesis of continental drift. He was not a geologist. Alfred Wegener was a meteorologist. He was from Germany. And he, again, noted how the coastlines of South America and Africa seemed to fit together, which, you know, not such a big deal because anybody that could look at a globe or a map could see that too. But years later, he accidentally came upon a fossil report that supported this idea of a land bridge between South America and Africa, trying to explain um, the fossil distribution that was found on both of these continents, how to explain it if there was an ocean there. So the only way that they could explain it was to say, hey, there used to be a land bridge there. 
Then while he was recuperating from wounds that he had received during World War I, he had an opportunity to delve into all the research that had been done at the time into the fields of geology, paleontology, climatology. Um, and, you know, this was quite an undertaking for him. It wasn't like he could go Google anything. All of this had to be, come from different libraries around the world. And from his research into these different lines of evidence, he came up with his idea of continental drift. So what was the evidence? Well, the first piece of evidence was that which everybody else had already noticed, the jigsaw puzzle fit of the continents. But he took that a step further and he said, hey, not only do they look like they fit together, when you look at the rock type and the structures on both sides of the Atlantic, they match up. Where you have a mountain range on one side of the Atlantic, there's a mountain range on the other side of the Atlantic where you have a particular rock type on one side of the, the Atlantic, that particular rock type is on the other side of the Atlantic in Africa. So that was pretty cool. Then he also looked at the distribution of fossils. He looked at several, but we'll just talk about two. Glossopterus, which is a plant fossil, a tropical plant fossil, and Mesosaurus, which is a little, uh, a little animal, a little dinosaur-like uh, animal. Uh, then he looked at glacial striations. Glacial striations are the big scratch marks that glaciers leave in rocks as they move across them, as they're scouring out everything. So uh, to, to um, Wegener, the orientation of the grooves looked like glaciers had their origins in the oceans and they move from the oceans up onto land. That's impossible. That's against all the laws of physics. That would be like asking you to believe that the Sacramento River flows from the Delta up to Mount Shasta, just physically impossible. But the orientation of the grooves indicated that. So Wegener said that can't be, that can't be uh, how it happens, but if you put the continents back together again, you see that the glaciers weren't moving from the ocean. It was, they were just moving from the adjacent landmass. And then polar wandering. Either the continents had to move or the poles moved, and that's not likely. We know that the magnetic pole changes its location, but not to the point that it would explain tropical swamps at one time being in Siberia and Wyoming, to name a few places or glaciers being in South Africa. So Wegener's hypothesis was that continents had wandered or drifted, not that the poles had wandered around or drifted, but that the continents had moved uh, around. And this started a firestorm of criticism for the man. So let's look at some of this evidence. Uh, if you put the continents back together again the way they seem to fit together again you see this matchup of these mountains the Appalachian Mountains actually match the Atlas Mountains here in Africa the Appalachian Mountains also extend at one time when everything was together the Appalachian Mountains extended into Greenland and into Great Britain and into portions of Scandinavia and then we have the same thing here in Africa in Africa over here, that's not Africa, this is Africa, in Africa and South America. So how else to explain this perfect match, especially, let me just give a, a little aside here, you know that serpentinite is California's state rock, but that doesn't mean that serpentinite can't be found other places. And there's a belt of serpentinite that runs through the Appalachian Mountains and the chemistry of that serpentinite you can have serpentinite and it can still be serpentinite, but it can vary in slightly in chemistry. Well, the belt of serpentinite that runs through the Appalachian Mountains matches exactly the belt of serpentinite that runs through Great Britain. So in order for that to happen, it had to form at the same temperature, the same pressure, the exact same temperature, the exact same pressure. So that means that it had to happen at the same time. So proof that the, these two were together at one time.
And there's just another view of some of the matchup. And then this is probably um, the continents as you have never seen them before. This is showing what happened when the Appalachian Mountains were built. It's Africa, and these, look at Europe, look what Europe looks like. Just these little slices, these little micro, these little macro islands here um, that smush together to form the Appalachian Mountains. That's about 200 million years ago. The Appalachian Mountains are the oldest mountain range in the world. Um, look over here in the west, no California at all. There was, most of the west was gone. You didn't have Nevada, most of Utah was gone. So that had to happen later, and we'll talk about how that did happen. It's a pretty interesting story. Now, this is Glossopteris. As I said before, Glossopteris is a tropical plant, and it's, fossil, it's no longer living, but its fossils are found in Africa, India, Australia, and Antarctica. Now, all these I could buy being tropical at one, at one uh, point in time, but not Antarctica. If Antarctica has been in its current location, and we know six months out of the year it's dark there, how in the world could a tropical plant grow there? It would be impossible. Well, Alfred Wegener said, Antarctica hasn't always been in that same location. It used to be in a more tropical location, and that's when Glossopteris grew there. And then Mesosaurus, this little dinosaur critter. This is not to scale, of course, but Mesosaurus's fossils have been found in only two places on Earth, in, in South America, portions of, of Brazil and Argentina, and in uh, Eastern Africa. So how does that happen? It was a freshwater animal, so it couldn't have survived a swim across the, the ocean. So it lived in this one large landmass when South America and Africa were at one time together, and then when it's, they split apart, that's why we find those fossils in two separate places. And then this is the, these are the glacial striations that we're talking about here, these scratch marks. So the rocks in South America seem to indicate that the glaciers moved from the ocean onto land. Same thing in India, same thing in Australia. We know that's impossible. So Alfred Wegener said, well, it's possible if you put all those land masses back together again, and we see that the, the glaciers weren't moving from the ocean onto land. They were just moving from the adjacent landmass. So this, I'm, I'm just showing these to show you that there are coal mines presently in Wyoming and in Siberia. And coal was formed in a swampy, tropical, swampy environment, which we know that Wyoming and Siberia today aren't in tropical and swampy environments. But Alfred Wegener said, they used to be. And then this is showing the distribution of um, Glossopteris and uh, Mesosaurus here, only two locations right here, South America and Africa. And then he looked at others, but you'll just be responsible for Mesosaurus animal, Glossopteris plant. So where did all of that evidence lead Wegener? It led him to propose that 200 million years ago, all the continents had been together into what he called a supercontinent that he called Pangaea. Pangaea is Greek for all lands. There was a northern part called Laurasia, and there was a southern part called Gondwana land. And he published a series of maps showing the breakup sequences of Pangaea starting about 200 million years ago. So I'm gonna show you this series of maps, but I'm gonna start out 500 million years ago. And if, you, if these names weren't attached to anything, there's nothing here that you would recognize. When we look at a map today, we recognize things from the shape. We recognize the shape of Africa, we recognize the shape of North America, South America, 
But here we have just kind of these blobs. They certainly aren't in the places that they, that they are today. Look at China. Does that look anything like the China today? And up here's Australia. Does that look anything like Australia today or in the location where Australia is? No. So that was 500 million years ago. There was one world ocean called the Panthalassic Ocean and these segments of crust. Then 300 million years ago, things are beginning to take shape, but still things aren't recognizable. We still have the Panthalassic Ocean over here and we have the opening of another ocean. Here's still that weird, these micro uh, islands of China and Siberia. Africa, South America, they don't look like the African South America of today. That was 300 million year, years ago. Then 200 million years ago, this is where Wegener picked it up. And you see that everything is together. There's the uh, Tethys Ocean, which is the ancestor of the Atlantic Ocean. And things are beginning to take shape. There's South America, you kind of recognize that. There's a little bit of Africa that looks recognizable, but North America, if it didn't have the name on it, I doubt you would recognize it. China now has become part of, of Eurasia here, so at least it's getting in kind of the same, the, the, the right uh, location. And look, no Western North America, no California, no Florida, most of Texas isn't there. And then 100 million years ago, things are kind of taking shape. Um, here's North America, but look, there's a shallow ocean that separates Eastern North America from Western North America. If you ever wondered why there's all this limestone in Texas and Indiana and North Dakota, South Dakota, it's because there was once an ocean there. My, the place that I grew up is called Saltville and it's right in this area here. Well, how the heck did that happen? Because there used to be an ocean there. So we have gypsum deposits, we have salt deposits. Still no California. And then 50 million years ago, things are beginning to take shape, but again, no California over here. How did it form? Well, we'll talk about that. Still no Florida, still most of Texas isn't there. And then to modern day, there's our, our globe today, but it's changing also. Things are on the move. So the problem with Wegener's hypothesis was that he couldn't explain the mechanism that would cause plates to move around. That was what the excuse was from the geology world. But some people think that that was just a convenient excuse that was used by geologists because one of their own hadn't proposed this, although one of their own actually had, and they ignored it. Arthur Holmes in 1928 talked about convection currents dragging two halves of, continent apart, of the continent apart. Arthur was right, but he was ignored as was Wegener. And Wegener got such criticism that, you know, it's really kind of a black eye to the, to the scientific world for the way that he was treated. Um, so again, why was, why was his theory so roundly criticized for, uh, by everybody? Well, first of all, he wasn't a geologist. Remember, he was a meteorologist. Secondly of all, he was German, and we had just got through fighting this horrible war with Germany. Uh, so when he proposed his idea, he decided to do it at um, a convention of petroleum geologists. Well, most of the petroleum geologists were either from Western Europe or America and Canada. And these were the, the, the uh, countries that were fighting against uh, the Germans. So he talked with a very thick German accent. He wasn't a geologist to begin with, and it didn't go over too well. So that's where it stood. There was no research being done and science advances through research. And most of that research is done by grad students and their advisors. But when you had the old guard at colleges and universities like Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Berkeley, they refused to advise any of their students that wanted to do research on continental drift. 
so the science couldn't advance. If a grad student didn't have an advisor, he or she had a dilemma, drop out of school or work on research that their advisor wanted them to work on. So the science in the area of continental drift came to a, a standstill. So um, Wegener decided, you know, sick of the criticism that he was getting, he decided he was gonna go back to his research um, in his own discipline of meteorology and climatology. And he was especially interested in the Greenland ice sheet. And it ends up that that's where he died. So he died never knowing what an influence that he was gonna have in earth science and geology. You can't pick up a geology book now without part of a chapter at least dedicated to uh, Alfred Wegener. But he didn't know any of this was gonna happen. So the alternative explanations were for to to explain how these fossils were ending up on both sides of the ocean were, okay, they rafted from one place to the other. And that's what these cartoons are showing, a little animal hitching a ride on a log across the ocean, which is implausible. Then this one, which shows a land bridge. Land bridges everywhere. If you look at an old uh, biogeography book from the 1940s and 50s and even into the 60s, in order to explain how species got from one place to the other, they put land bridges everywhere. There was a land bridge between North America and Europe. There was a land bridge between South America and Africa. There was a land bridge between Africa and India. There are land bridges on Earth, but you can't just throw one in as a convenient way to explain why certain things are found where they are. Uh, and then there was island hopping. Well, with what we know about how plate tectonics works, this could, this makes sense. There's um, a turtle called the green turtle. This turtle swims for miles from an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to lay its eggs in Florida, beaches of South America. And it's always been a mystery as to how this this turtle can swim so far and how these babies that are born when they get old enough they start swimming back to this island in the Atlantic so it might be that the distances just started increasing incrementally and then over a hundred million years or whatever the time frame was um, they just would swim a little bit further each year and we got these you know, hundreds of miles that built up over time. And then of course, this last one right here is continental drift. I don't know if you can see this, but here's a little dinosaur right here. Mother dinosaur, baby dinosaur, and they're crying because they're being separated by continental drift. So this is Alfred Wegener. He was really a young man when he died, uh, only in his 40s. So he had a lot of good science left in him. This is the last picture of him taken before he died. Um, they were on an expedition in Greenland and he had an advance party that had gone out onto the ice sheet and they weren't radioing back to the main camp. So Wegener and his uh, guide went out to find them and they were okay. So, but Wegener decided that he was gonna go back to the main camp that day and he didn't show up. So when they went to look for him, they found that he was dead. Um, he had passed out on the ice sheet, maybe from a heart attack or something, but they buried his body in the ice in Greenland. And he is not forgotten. This is the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Studies in Bremerhaven, Germany. And again, you can't pick up a textbook without Wegener's name being mentioned, but unfortunately he didn't live to know the influence that he was gonna have in the field of geology. We had to wait for, just like with a lot of things, new technology to come along. And in this particular case, it was new technology related to, that was developed during World War II called the echo sounder. You might know that better as sonar. So his vindication came about during and after World War II as a result of this new technology. And I'm gonna stop here and pick up with this in part two of chapter 10. I hope everybody's safe and happy and hope 
to see you soon, but it sounds like maybe we won't. Uh, I guess we'll just have to wait till the announcement comes through. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Okay, bye-bye for now.